Hi there. I know that people are sort of streaming in. I'm going to wait to give it a beat um, as the as everyone uh, starts to join before before kicking off. But thank you all so much for joining today. I know Climate Week is a busy one. You'll probably notice that both my voice and Joanna's voices are, are going a little bit um, because of the craziness of Climate Week. But um, we're really excited for today's um, webinar and to have you all here um, to talk a little bit about the intersection between climate change and public health. Um, which is a sort of a, the focus on this is increasing with each climate week, um, which is very exciting to see. Awesome. So I see people sort of streaming in. So in the interest of time, um, I'm going to, I'm going to kick us off. So thank you all for joining and welcome to our webinar on building for tomorrow, enhancing resilience in the built environment during the climate crisis. Um, as we sort of warm up for today's conversation, would love if you could take a moment, think a little bit about interventions in the built environment where you, you see either in your work or your day-to-day -day experience um, that promote health while also mitigating climate change. I think you'll see today, we'll be really focusing on where that intersection lies um, and the ways in which our built environment can uh, address both climate change and health simultaneously and sort of that the, the path between the two. Um, so my name is Sarah Carrera. I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Active Design. Um, we're thrilled to have you here today to explore this topic. It's not only timely, but really essential to the future of our, our places and spaces. Um, we can't look at anything in a silo anymore. We really need to be able to break down those boundaries and address um, the concerns holistically to make sure that we're having the greatest impact possible. Um, before we fully jump in, I want to start by sharing one thing that I'm really excited for about today's conversation, which is really um, looking forward to breaking down the divisions um, that sometimes arise um, in between uh, sustainability and health focused um, areas, and then also lift up the evidence base that our work is all based around um, that kind of highlights the ways that we can intervene in the built environment to create um, a healthier future. So today I'm also joined by um, my colleague, Joanna Frank, um, president and CEO of Fitwell. She, many of you are likely familiar with her. She's a leader in the healthy building movement. Um, many of you probably know that her really incredible work has been pivotal, pivotal in shaping the way that we think about our places and spaces and how they can um, promote health across um, our population. So thank you so much for joining today, Joanna. No, oh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, awesome. So ahead of diving into some of the questions we have, I want to start by um, showing a brief agenda of what we're going to be focused on today. We'll be really covering four key areas. The first is how climate change and public health really intersect with one another, um, how we work to translate research into actionable solutions. Third, why a people first approach leads to that creation of long term value. And finally, the path forward in building climate resilience and what that future may hold. What is what what do we foresee? We don't have a crystal ball, but what predictions can we make? And then by the end of today's conversation, there are several key takeaways that we are hoping people walk away with. Um, the first is an understanding of the weight of the issue from a people first perspective and the role the built environment plays in navigating those risks. There's a lot of power that built environment practitioners have. How can we leverage and harness that um, to have the greatest impact possible? Um, the second is how the evidence base can help inform practical efforts now and into the future. We really have the ability, we have a lot of information. How can we leverage that um, and, and really act in this moment, but then also plan for the future for things that we need to either get more information about or um, that we need sort of long-term planning for to impact. Um, and the third is what the value proposition is. How do we appeal to sort of um, the developers, the investors, the owners to really ensure that we're making the case um, as compelling as possible because we know there is one. Um, and what is that connection between um, health, sustainability, and that um, bottom line um, value proposition? Um, so that those are sort of the areas that we're, we're planning to focus on today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit those during the conversation. Um, you should see a Q&A box. Feel free to uh, type those in there and we will do our best to get to them at the end. Um, if you encounter any technical difficulties, please put those into the chat. Um, and also feel free to um, introduce yourselves, um, say where you're coming from in the chat to sort of engage with our other attendees. Um, so with that, I am going to jump into our conversation. 
Um, and I want to start with a question for Joanna around um, that intersection between climate change and public health. We often hear that those two issues are inseparable. We've already said that multiple times in the past five minutes. Um, but how did we arrive at this point and why is this um, area so urgent now to address? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I think, you know, as an industry, the real estate industry has been really focused on the impact that real estate has on exacerbating the climate crisis. Uh, and we've been laser focused on that over the last few years, which is which was important. Right. So that is that stat around the 40 percent of the global energy related carbon emissions is actually coming from our buildings um, and the building sector. So that, I think, is a stat that many of you will already know. You understand that real estate is contributing to climate change. Where we're focusing today is really on the other side of that coin, and that is how can we really design and adapt our built environment, our buildings, our communities to withstand the impact of climate change? How do we adapt and create more resilient communities that support the quality of life for our communities, for the occupants of buildings? Um, and how do we do that in a way that is sustainable? Um, and then one of the big kind of takeaways here is that um, our built environment does have a profound impact on our health, of course, and I think hopefully for those of you attending, you know that that is something that we've been talking about um, for the last decade, right? There's a very strong evidence base around the connection that the built environment plays and our health outcomes, our mental health, our physical health, our community health. How do we really understand that in the context of climate change? I think a big aha moment for the industry last year was uh, around COP28 when The Lancet put out a peer-reviewed uh, piece of research. Um, and the bottom line of that research was that in order to really fully understand the impact of climate change, the only way to really quantify that impact was uh, looking at it from that public health lens. Um, and it is that public health lens that we're looking at. How do we leverage our built environment in order to adapt to climate change, understanding we want to both limit the impact real estate is having on exacerbating climate change, but we also have to face reality these days. And that is that we are seeing changes to our climates, which are exacerbating um, areas that are at risk and people that are at risk because of those climate change um, factors. And so it's really that that's the side of the conversation we're looking at. How do we take our built environment and adapt it so that it can withstand um, the more extreme uh, climates that we're all facing at this point? Yeah, and I think that's a really, really strong point just around in order to sort of achieve the mission of building health for all, we can't ignore the realities of climate change that we're facing and sort of how do we adapt our environments to those um, directly in response to um, those those areas that we're experiencing. So sort of now that you've sort of laid out the, the importance, the urgency where we are in this current moment, um, how do you see fit well? How have we sort of um, been able to take the research, take what's going on in the world, and then apply that to translating it into actionable solutions across sort of what the greatest risks we're facing are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's funny that I'm talking about this because it's very much Sarah's teams that have been focusing on this. So I'm sure Sarah can fill in any of the details. But what we've done at Fitwell is we're an evidence-based standard. We're an evidence-based organization. We've already done, I think, a great job of looking at the public health research to understand how do we leverage our built environment for all aspects of public health? Um, and what we've seen over the last kind of three or four years was that there has been an increased number of uh, research studies, a real understanding of the role that climate change plays as far as public health is concerned. So what we've done at Fitwell is that as we, as the evidence base has expanded, so we're now at 7,000 peer-reviewed research studies, uh, we're at 5,500 for the previous standard, so we've just updated the standard. Um, and because that emphasis of the research community has been on the public health impact of climate change, we have added a number of strategies to the Fitwell standard that reflect that evidence base and reflect the understanding that we now have about how to mitigate some of those health impacts uh, by leveraging aspects of our built environment. Um, and so we're just going to share a few of those strategies because they are at the intersection of uh, climate change, health, and the built environment. Um, and these are strategies that a lot of real estate has already been focusing on because um, they impact energy use. So they've been looking at them from the lens of energy use or physical risk to buildings. We are now looking at these strategies and saying, 
what is the risk to people based on these uh, climate change? And it's those two things that come together here. Um, so we really understand both the physical risk to, to the physical building, um, but really what does that mean for the people inside the building and the people in the community at large? Um, so let's just kind of go through a few of these. I think that they're all very um, tangible, hopefully. So ask questions if they're not tangible. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is really around heat. Um, nobody, uh, nobody, I think, can deny at this point that we are seeing uh, extreme heat. We're seeing heat exacerbated because of climate change. Um, and so how do we use our built environment to really offset the impact that that extra heat, heat is having on people? Um, we know that there are many evidence-based strategies that actually reduce the air temperature around buildings, which is what people are affected by. Um, so one of those, just as an example, would be a green roof. You know, green roof actually 40% uh, cooler than a traditional roof structure. That is a massive difference, obviously. Um, and it has in turn, not just an impact on the, the temperature of the structure, but it's also lowering surrounding temperatures by five degrees. Um, and we'll get back to the kind of like why it matters that we understand how much of an impact each of these strategies are having, because that is very important. Um, and heat itself is affecting mortality, People die of heat, uh, of heat related illnesses more than any other actually of the climate risks that are facing public health. So heat is a real threat to life as well as obviously to overall health uh, and wellness as well. So um, very tangible connection between air temperature and our ability to thrive, uh, which is what we're talking about here. And so what do we do about that? So the FitWell standard obviously is articulating what are the strategies that actually reduce a uh, heat island effect, that reduce the, the air temperature around buildings. Um, so that includes having low, uh, kind of light colored roofs, uh, um, having the green roofs as we're talking about. Um, the green roofs are particularly interesting because they don't just reduce the physical temperature of the roof, but the, um, the evapotranspiration from the plants themselves actually lowers the air temperature as well. So they, they actually do double duty. And then where this becomes, I think, core business for real estate, because we really care about scale. How do we scale this impact? And in order to really uh, have the attention of the full industry, we need to be able to show why this is core business for real estate, why promoting the health of, health of occupants and communities is directly in line with other business priorities. And that, uh, that kind of motivation has led us to also layer on top of the health evidence base, the economic evidence base. So for the last two years, we've been pulling economic evidence, overlaying it with the FitWell standard, and now we can really articulate what is the impact this strategy is having on health and what is the impact this strategy is having on measures of value and risk for real estate. So when it comes to heat island mitigation strategies that are lowering that surrounding temperature of the air for people, we can articulate how that's affecting health. And now we can say for every degree of cooling of that air temperature, there is a related um, $50 uh, increase in the overall rent premium, and there is a $1,000 energy saving per building. So now we can really talk about this, that it's lowering operating costs, um, and it's also increasing the value of your asset uh, by measures of return on investment. So now we can kind of make that full argument, it's like this is a strategy that will reduce the heat island impact that your building is having, and this is the quantifiable impact on health, and this is the quantifiable impact on value or risk mitigation, um, which is incredibly important because we need to make the business case for health, right? We need to uh, be able to explain with data, with with the numbers, with the substantiate, with like facts we can substantiate why this is uh, a business case for health. Another strategy, uh, one that has become really popular actually over the last three years, this is a, a new strategy to fit well, um, but not a new idea, and that's biodiversity. Um, so why are we talking about biodiversity when we're talking about buildings? Um, and it's really because the majority of the ice-free world, <laughs> we humans have uh, impacted that uh, landscape. Uh, and a lot of that is obviously with the built environment. So how, as professionals who are creating our built environments, can we really support biodiversity? Biodiversity is limiting carbon emissions. It's increasing um, human immune systems because of exposure to that uh, kind of uh, wider uh, wider source of pollutants, uh, sorry, not pollutants, pollens and so on, as you can imagine. You know, if you're in, in an environment that has a lot of hay fever, 
um, having local bees and local honey um, is actually a way to reduce your immune res response to your local environment, which is just incredible, right? It's such a simple thing to do, but adding bee boxes and then having that local honey has been shown to actually reduce your uh, allergies uh, to local um, pollens and so on. Um, and so there are simple solutions. I think this is another thing we want to talk about. Like all of the solutions, uh, all of these strategies in Fitwell, they are practical and implementable at scale. This is not reinventing real estate, this is not something that you've never heard of before. So having, you know, biodiversity by planting native species that are local to the environment uh, that you're working in, that you're building in, um, and then something as simple as a bee box uh, can really make a difference. And then the next one um, that we're just going to talk about here, um, this is the biodiversity. The numbers associated with biodiversity are shockingly high. They're in the trillions. Um, and so I think that that's just a kind of uh, indicative of what a, a large role that our, our natural environment is playing on health and, and also value. You can see here that... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's just me. Um, Janelle, do you know if Joanna is, um, if her internet looks a little wonky? Okay, it sounds like we lost her. So I'm gonna um, tag in, um, Joanna will be back, I have no doubt. Um, and just uh, talk a little bit about, yeah, the biodiversity, the value. So yeah, as Joanna was sort of saying, this 150 trillion number really is striking. Um, and I think it just goes to show that the impact that we can have with these kind of relatively straightforward solutions, I don't think we'll ever make up that one full $150 trillion um, amount. But really, when you think about all of the different ways that buildings can um, weather through um, whether through uh, the implementation of air filtration or carbon storage can have that impact. Um, it looks like Joanna might be back with us. Um, so I will pass it back to her to move on to the next um, the next area that we wanted to touch on. Great. Yeah, thank you. I don't know. I upset the Zoom gods and they just dropped me. Wow. Um, not good timing. But anyway, thank you, folks. Sorry. And I'm sure Sarah was very <laughs> capable of, of continuing the conversation. Um, and so the last uh, the last kind of strategy we want to highlight, because again, it's at that intersection of climate change and health, um, and that is around flood prone zones. Um, so flood prone zones, that's obviously something that we've been looking at as, a, as an industry um, around uh, physical risk to buildings. We're really looking at flood prone zone. What does this mean to health? What does it mean to the overall health of the occupants of the buildings and the community at large? And then what can we do as the owners of that that built environment to really mitigate the risk of flood? What are the strategies that actually reduce the risk of, of flood? Um, and how can we really focus on those uh, to support health and also obviously the value conversation, which, which is very important when it comes to flood prone zones. Uh, we are also seeing um, a lot of the population, certainly in the US, um, and I'm not sure what the audience where folks are based, but, but we're seeing a lot of uh, folks move to areas that are in flood prone zones. So this isn't, a, this isn't an issue that is actually decreasing, certainly in the US. We're actually seeing large population moving. I think it's 300,000 in the last year that have moved into flood prone zones. So this is an, this is an issue around equity, right? This is a, an issue around housing. Um, and this is an issue that is growing as a risk to human health um, and not actually uh, declining. So very important that we understand what are the tangible kind of strategies um, that we can use, uh, which again, are in football. So we don't need to repeat them here. Um, but the next slide. Um, and I think what is interesting about the flood prone, decreasing risk of flood prone uh, zones, it's really um, one of the highest return on investment. So for every dollar that you invest in these uh, flood mitigation strategies, there's actually a $7 return on investment, according to FEMA. So that is a very high return for every dollar spent. Um, and so obviously, that's going to make a difference when developers are looking at properties and thinking like, you know, how can we improve the overall performance of this building in investing in these flood prone strategies, uh, these mitigating these flood prone uh, strategies is, is a really good return on investment, uh, as far as the data is concerned. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think you you laid all of that out so clearly. And I think like one thing just to add is 
what we're seeing too is it's not just these big crisis moments that are causing um, major concerns, but what Joanna was talking about where heat is one of the greatest threats that we're facing. It's not necessarily meaning that it's only um, uh, just the, you know, like that, that, you know, the wildfire risk and those pieces of it, but really looking at, okay, these um, rising temperatures are having such a profound impact specifically on those who are suffering from other chronic diseases. So that really just goes to show you that it's not just this one issue in isolation, it's how it interacts with our system of issues where um, if we have um, sort of a less healthy population, then that's going to make the risks associated with these rising temperatures, these flood um, events that much more dire. So really creating and thinking about resilience as the system is vital to be able to address um, it at its core um, and get at sort of, sort of some of the root causes there. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And kind of adding on to that, we saw during COVID, um, and Sarah and I are both, both based in New York City, so know the New York stats probably better than most, but um, we saw in New York that uh, New York City has very kind of um, defined areas of greater um, of greater pollution, air pollution, and we know that the Bronx has the highest levels of of particulates in the air. We know also that the Bronx has the highest risk of uh, asthma and highest asthma rates uh, in in the city. Also, uh, not surprising uh, as it has also the poorest air quality. And what we saw during COVID was that there was also the highest mortality rate in that uh, in those neighborhoods because of the underlying uh, health impacts that the built environment could have been used to mitigate. Um, and so there was some modeling done that was really looking at kind of um, if the air pollution had been at the kind of standard rate across New York City, more than 200 lives uh, would have been saved, uh, according to, you know, kind of uh, computer generated models. So this is something that is really profound. And it is that kind of, it's all of these contributing factors leading to populations that have uh, lower life expectancies, quality of lives that are affected in a way that is not equal, right? So this is definitely an equity issue also. Um, so what we've done, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, uh, Sarah, do you wanna kind of set up here what we've what we're showing folks? Yeah, definitely. So now that Joanna has sort of dug a little bit into the specifics of the connection between um, the um, health implementation and then value, we wanted to show a little bit deeper, where is that value pop proposition? What does that look like? How can we make the case to stakeholders that are sort of d decision makers within um, our built spaces to show why this is in everyone's interest um, and where that um, real, where those incentives lie. Um, so this is sort of connecting that all together. And I'll let Joanna sort of talk through the work that we've done within this space to, to connect the dots. Absolutely. So we are really looking at how do we scale this impact, right? So the evidence base exists. We've got 7,000 peer reviewed research studies on the health side. We've got two years of uh, data around the economic benefit. How do we bring all of this information together and make it actionable and make it a compelling narrative that really starts to see real estate, whether you're buying assets, whether you're developing them, whether you're designing them, uh, whatever whatever role you play operating them, um, whatever role you play, you really understand how your piece of the puzzle is impacting health and how that in turn is impacting the value of your assets. Um, and then how do we take all of this information and very relevantly uh, during UN Climate Week, like how do we uh, show how this connects in that into that broader conversation about sustainability. So that broader conversation about sustainability includes the conversation around environmental, social, and governance investment. Uh, so ESG, as folks have probably heard, um, it also includes the UN sustainability goals. So mapping this with those other global frameworks that people are committed to, um, to really demonstrate compliance with. So looking at the UN taxonomy, looking at the UN, um, so the EU taxonomy, the, U, the UN uh, sustainability goals, looking at SASB, which is one of the sustainable accounting practices, um, and GRESB, which uh, if you are in real estate, you're very familiar with GRESB, especially at this time of the year. Um, and this is one of those global frameworks looking at ESG. 
So what we've done is we've taken the FitWell strategies um, and we've looked at what is the health impact of each of these strategies and then what is the economic impact. And so for the bucket of strategies we're looking at today, which are really around those resilience strategies, so we're looking at how do we ensure that our built environment has been optimized to be resilient to climate change. And we're always focusing on existing, right? Yes, new, you should be acing it. You should definitely be looking at this. But really what we're focusing on is if I have an existing asset and it has these risks, what can I do to mitigate this risk? What can I do to mitigate that risk of flood? Uh, what can I do to mitigate that that extreme heat that we're suffering? Because my property is in, in a, a band uh, in the US or any part of the world um, that has days that are above 100 degrees, many consecutive days, or has single days that are above 125 degrees. Um, so I think it's really understanding the existing risk in your buildings, and then how do you use this evidence-based approach to mitigate that risk? And so what we've done is, if we look at the climate resilience strategies, the climate resilience strategies are impacting community health, they're reducing um, morbidity, meaning they're increasing life expectancy for those who don't speak public health. Um, instilling feelings of well-being, that's around mental health outcomes, like how do we understand that connection between how our built environment is impacting our mental health, especially at a time where mental health for all different generations is declining, and it's especially declining for uh, our youngest generation. Their, their mental health has really uh, deteriorated for many different factors, but how can we use our built environment to really create an environment that supports uh, optimum mental health? And how do we understand that? Um, also promoting equity, right? I've already said this a few times, we don't all experience climate change equally. Um, and it's very much a compounding factor. We are seeing folks, vulnerable populations who are already vulnerable because of a whole myriad of different factors um, are those who are typically at the greatest risk of these climate related um, extreme weather events. Um, and then the last one, safety. I mean, obviously, I think it goes without saying that this is about safety, um, but really being able to demonstrate how this impacts safety and what are the tangible things that we can do about it, right? What are the evidence-based strategies we can use to mitigate this risk? And then on the other side, and this is the new news, and that is what is the quantifiable impact on value? So increasing return on investment. How am I reducing my risk exposure? Um, so that's certainly what ESG is looking at. You know, it's looking at uh, legal risk and financial risk. Um, increasing employee productivity, um, really kind of understanding how can I create a more resilient environment? And then how can I talk to my tenants about this? Or how can I talk to my employees about this? Um, because we're seeing a lot of demand coming from individuals who understand that connection now greater than ever about how their built environment is affecting health. And then the last one is reducing on-site operating costs. So those of you who speak real estate know that as NOI, like how do we uh, ensure that we are operating our buildings as efficiently as possible, um, because that obviously is a direct has a direct impact on financial performance um, and is particularly of importance to existing buildings and how we uh, continue to manage and maintain existing buildings. Um, so we can now correlate the connection between the strategies that we're talking about. So there's flyer fire prone zone, it's flood prone zone, it's looking at stormwater mitigation, heat island effect. How can we we can now show the industry that they have it's having this this double impact. And then if we get down, down into really specific strategies, um, we're looking at uh, now we're looking at kind of some of the indoor strategies. So uh, kitchen ventilation, something as simple as kitchen ventilation. I think those of you who live in New York um, have probably seen all of the kind of uh, uh, legislation around uh, removing gas uh, out of new construction and then over the long long term taking gas out of uh, existing as well um, around gas stoves um, a lot of that is because of energy and because of wanting a clean uh, a cleaner energy um, en energy use but it also has a profound impact on health like we know that using gas in the homes is uh, creating localized uh, increases in asthma rates and so on. It's it's a, it's a pollutant. Um, and so kitchen ventilation is a really simple solution that, that we can do. And it's, a, it's also correlated to value as well. So it's affecting health, it's affecting value. Um, noise, not something we talk about a lot, but in indoor acoustics, exterior acoustics, um, these things really have a big impact on value as well. Um, so a lot of strategies that we can now correlate to both value and dental health, which, um, the reason for doing that is to really broaden the tent and to ensure that we can now make a business argument to the whole of real estate uh, that promoting health and understanding our built environment from this perspective is really in your core business interest. 
And then like, what's kind of behind some of these numbers? I think what we always talk about uh, at Fitwell is that we're really responding to two big demand drivers. The industry is responding to two big demand drivers for health. We have demand from tenants. They'll really understand now the connection between their health and the buildings that they live in and the buildings that they work in and the communities that they live in as well and work in. So we as a population globally now have a much clearer understanding of how our built environment is affecting our physical health and our mental health. And that has uh, correlated into demand. Tenants are demanding environments that are health promoting. Tenants are demanding environments that are safe. Tenants are demanding environments that are going to maintain the quality of life of themselves and their families, even in the face of changing uh, weather patterns and climate change. So tenant demand is really driving, obviously, the changes in the market, but also the value of actually responding to that tenant demand, right? That will then lead to higher um, higher rates of retention of your existing tenants um, and also uh, give you a competitive advantage when you're looking to differentiate your assets against all of the other assets in the market in whatever sector you're in, whether it's residential, whether it's office, whether it's industrial. Um, responding to that demand is a way to differentiate your, your, um, your buildings. And then on the other side of the demand coin are investors. And investors, increasingly, uh, global investors, are are demanding really high quality data so that they can understand what is the risk in this portfolio? What is the risk of these buildings um, when it comes to this evolving understanding of risk around climate change? Uh, there's the kind of near-term risk, obviously there's the physical risk, and then there's that longer term risk, especially as in insurance rates reflect uh, that ongoing risk. And how do you mitigate that? So first of all, how do you quantify it? And then how do you mitigate it in a way that has the greatest potential to mitigate that? Uh, so these are the two demand drivers that we are laser focused on that the industry is feeling um, for the for all of for all of you who are kind of managing real estate who are investing in real estate etc um, so being able to quantify that risk is is essential right if we if we can't measure it it's very hard to change it um, and now we can measure it so uh, this is a big step forward um, and last just to kind of go back to that uh, that flood mitigation measure. This is just a stat, but I think that it's it's just um, important that we know how to tell our stories. Um, and I think it's important that we identify these stories that are really going to resonate. Um, and so that $7 return for every dollar invested is something that um, I think is very compelling. It's something that is worth repeating. Um, and it's something that is a bit of an aha moment. Like who knew that uh, that mitigating flood would have such a, a big impact on, on the overall value of assets. And now I am going to become the questioner. So that's nice because usually I get to answer the questions, but Sarah, I am gonna turn it over to you. Um, so given the focus on people and resilience, where do you see sustainability movement going um, in this next phase, especially as it, as it relates to real estate? Yeah, so I'm excited to dig into this because we think a lot about this um, at Center for Active Design and Fitwell. How can we sort of drive the movement, but then also respond to the needs of um, those who are who are really um, implementing? And what we've really seen is that um, the need for data and better understanding um, portfolios where impact can be had is really um, a gap. There is um, lots of there are lots of different providers of um, data within this space, but no one who's really sort of uh, working to sort of bring everything together. And that's what we're really um, striving to do is make sure that we are helping our users. People want to make data informed decisions. How can we um, share back all of the information that has been shared with us as a certification platform um, with our users to help them better understand where they can have an impact? So what you see sort of on the screen is just a glimpse of our of our platform um, and ambitions for our platform of being able to help um, kind of translate back the information that has been input through the certification platform. We never sort of had ambitions to, to just be a one-stop shop of like certify a building, walk away, never think about it again. We really want this to be and see this as a process of, of using the tools and our tools that we offer as a way to um, reinforce, better understand where the gaps we have sort of offer a gap analysis um, feature where we can help um, folks better understand where they can have the greatest impact. So for example, if they really want to um, impact um, mental health within their space, they can see the strategies that are, are having that 
um, impact and really hone in on them. Um, and so we really want to and see within the sustainability movement um, a need for um, built environment practitioners to be supported in their journey um, with more information, more knowledge about the spaces and how they sort of relate compared to others within um, the industry so that they understand where the opportunities are and where they can grow and expand. Um, so that's really one of our core focuses moving forward is how can we um, continue to enhance the information that we're, we're providing. So it's not just about sort of the one-stop shop stats that are sort of going to give um, sort of that macro view. How can we make it more contextual? How can we make it more related to um, your portfolio, your assets, um, and, and make it that much more applicable? Um, and now not to kind of take away um, from me answering questions, but to turn it back to Joanna um, for a final question around um, what you see um, as the future within the sustainability space and where you see this movement going and some of the core needs um, within, within the connection between sustainability and health. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to answer that. I'm actually going to just flip to one of the questions that we got from folks listening. So thank you. Um, and that was really around kind of like, how are we going to have a holistic understanding of how um, all of these interventions are really going to get penciled into a pro forma, like kind of into the bottom line of real estate. Um, and I think that what we're showing are individual studies, the the work that needs to be done, like we have a big uh, big evidence base as far as the economic evidence is concerned. Um, what Sarah just mentioned, and it's something that we're committed to continue, is that we are working with our users to really understand how does what we see as research um, and the evidence base, how does that translate into individual buildings performance? Uh, we've already done, we did a big study with uh, Quadrail a couple of years ago, which actually took their Fitwell strategies, their financial um, performance and overlay the two to really understand what was driving value and what where the risk was within an individual portfolio, um, using the evidence-based strategies as the most likely to have the greatest impact on both health and value. Um, and so I think that, yes, it's not, um, we won't get to a nice, neat dollar figure that we can put on a pro forma, um, but we can identify the relative impact of these strategies and the relative uh, impact on value of each of these strategies. And then as the data becomes richer and as we work more with um, with our users, you know, who are working at scale across the industry, we can start to articulate what that means for individual asset types, what that means in a in a particular geography. Um, so that is all that is all future, but is certainly something that we're aware of. The other question that I think we can answer right now, and that is like, how are these built environment strategies instilling feelings of well being, which is the mental health impact? Um, the mental health impact is actually quantifiable for each of the strategies that we've just shown. Um, so flood risk is impacting mental health in a quantifiable way. Heat island. A mitigation or the the reverse of heat island mitigation is impacting um is is impacting uh mental health outcomes also um and so all of that additional stress of being in an area where you have un like understand that you're at, at greater risk is impacting mental health um so yes happy to talk more about mental health the biophilia access to views of nature being within nature has a very positive impact on health uh some of these others it's more of a negative impact on health um so yes there's definitely a lot of information on that um and that's certainly something that we'd be happy to dig into uh, and follow up with um so yeah, where I see the future is. Uh, so I am I'm excited that a lot of these answers already exist. And I think that that's exciting. That's what I always want to give folks as a takeaway. We do not need to reinvent the wheel to know how to continue to invest in our built environment to really adapt it uh, so that it continues to be able to um, allow people who are interacting with the built environment to thrive. So. We already have this evidence base. This evidence base is very robust. Um, we know how to create an environment that's optimized for people. I think that adding that value piece of the puzzle really helps to uh, ensure that we're prioritizing this uh, adaptation and that we're prioritizing these strategies because we can make an argument when decisions are being made and they're dollars and cents decisions being made in real estate, how do we ensure that these strategies are part of that conversation? And obviously that is very much by providing more information um, so that folks understand the impact it's having uh, on the value and the overall risk. 
And, and I see the future really being one of taking our existing built environment and how do we continue to adapt and iterate on our existing built environment because we cannot build our way out of this, right? The amount of embedded carbon that it, that it would require in order for us to rebuild our built environment, there's no way that that's, uh, you know, that that's a possibility. So yes, new construction needs to be laser focused on creating environments that that mitigate uh, the impact of climate change while of course doing so in a way that is using as little carbon as possible. Um, but really the solution will be about taking up existing built environment because that is what we experience. And that is what we will continue ex to experience over the next 30 years. I think 70%, yeah, 70% of the, of the buildings that we have today will still be around by 2050. So these are the buildings that are gonna see us through these profound changes that we, that we know are coming as far as um, these uh, climate uh, impacts that, that that will be happening, even if we're able to uh, really reduce the amount of um, climate change uh, that that actually uh, ends up, or hopefully ends up at one point stopping. But um, so we already have these changes that are going to happen. Um, so using our existing buildings, retrofitting our existing buildings and our existing neighborhoods. Really, I, I've always joked to the team, when I retire, I'm just going to be like planting trees, basically, because there really is no downside in having more street trees. Um, this is, uh, you know, shade, absolutely important. I love the Roman era of uh, construction. Um, and one of my favorite cities in the world is Bologna. And it has these beautiful physical arcades where you're walking through shaded spaces across the whole city. You know, these are the kind of things that we we really need to be thinking about, like how do we create permanent shaded um, buildings? How do we ensure we're using materials when we build that are highly insulated um, and, and, and reduce the amount of energy we need to heat and cool them in the first place? Uh, because obviously that's part of that cycle of exacerbating climate change. Um, more green space, just more and more and more green space, right? More vegetation, more porous uh, landscapes, et cetera. So we know what to do. Now it's a case of how do we do this at the kind of scale that is going to make a difference? And that is the challenge. The scaling piece uh, is the challenge that we all now need to really kind of understand that this should be uh, part of the thinking in every decision that's being made. Awesome. And I know um, we received one more question um, that I will do my best to answer because I was actually just on a webinar with a group that was focused on sort of the subterranean spaces. Um, and this is really around how, what research have you done on subterranean structures for a municipal scale? And if I'm being honest, this is not an area that we have focused on, but I will say there are great groups out there. So one that I um, participated on a webinar with the ITA Committee on Underground Space is specifically focused on this issue. Um, so I would say this is just an example of how um, we want to support others working within this space. We don't have the um, answers to every question, but really are focused on collaborating, lifting up other um, practitioners within the space that are looking into sort of those niche and specific specific areas and issues. So thank you for that question. Um, and with that, I think we are, um, if anybody has any last minute questions, please um, send those in and we'll do our best to answer. Um, if you think of anything afterwards, please feel free um, to shoot us a note. Um, Joanna and I are both on LinkedIn and um, happy to reach out and engage. Um, and really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today. I know Climate Week is a busy one. Uh, so really uh, grateful for the time you guys have spent with us. And thank you for engaging in this issue and thinking about that relationship between climate change and health. Um, we we need the, the collaboration and the interest within this space. So thank you all. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Sarah.